every time we come out here to preach meetings, I always bring, uh, normally my wife comes, and uh, she told me this year, she said, if you want to take Isaac, uh, that, that'll be fine with her. She wanted to come, but um, we wanted to let Isaac come back out. Now he's an adult. Last time he came, we traumatized him. Uh, the night before we left, uh, I made him watch the movie Castaway. And uh, he said, Daddy, you shouldn't do that. I said, well, I want you to just see what could happen. And so, just... <laughs> and so we get here, and Brother John gives him a volleyball with the uh, imprint of his hand on the sign, like the movie Castaway. And, we, and so they nicknamed Isaac Wilson. He still has that ball. It's in his room. Real blood, that's not pain on that. Yeah. There's two things he ain't done in a long time. That's sweated or bled. So I'm... I doubt seriously, that's probably pain. But anyway, uh, we, uh, it's been some time since Isaac's been here, so my wife wanted him to be able to come uh, this year. And so um, I'm glad Isaac's able to come Amen. and uh, be here. Thank you all for the sacrifice that it takes to put this meeting on. There's a lot that goes into this, and I know that. And uh, the sacrifice is made for plane tickets and then motel and uh, just give us um, a place to come and enjoy ourselves. And um, we've been coming out here for years. I don't, I don't really remember uh, what year we came out here the first time. And uh, so, um, but it's been a long time. And I'm glad to get to meet some friends. Every time I come back now, I find that somebody has since passed away. I, I will not get to see them again, but I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see you in the house of God. And I hope and pray we can make a good friendship and, and uh, hope and pray we'll be a blessing to you. Do ask for your prayers. The South is about to get hit by a massive hurricane. Uh, we live uh, in Lakeland, Georgia. Lakeland, Georgia is, is uh, three and a half hours south of, of Atlanta. That's how far uh, into the south we live. I can be in uh, Jasper, Florida in 30 minutes. I can be at the Atlantic Ocean at uh, Jekyll Island within two hours. I can be at the Gulf uh, of Mexico within two hours. That's how far south I am. That hurricane is not supposed to hit us directly. It's going towards New Orleans, and so uh, they're saying that it's going to be bigger than even than even Katrina was. Oh and so um, we are in uh, we're in direct line of other hurricanes that happens every year. And uh, so this one looks like we're going to miss it, but it's so big uh, we may actually get some of it. So I do cover your prayers. It's supposed to be coming in today or tomorrow, I believe. And uh, this saying, if they if they are accurate in their forecast, this is going to be massive. And so we do covet your prayers for uh, for those back home. Exodus chapter 16, if you're able. You normally stand, preacher. Y'all normally have them stand. With yeah, the I oh, Okay. <laughs> Exodus chapter uh, number uh, 16. I may have said 14. I meant 16. Forgive me. I do that all the time at my church as well. I tell them the wrong place and then act like they're... They're heathens for not knowing where I'm going. <laughs> Exodus chapter 16. Uh, for those that do not know me, I, I am Mike Qualls. I pastored the Lakeland Baptist Church in Lakeland, Georgia. And uh, I was in evangelism for years. And that's when I started preaching revival meets here years ago. Been preaching over 30-some years now. And uh, God has been good to us. Mary, my wife and I, we have four children. As I mentioned, Isaac's my youngest. Uh, all of my children have been here. Uh, Levi, my oldest one, came. Brother John always nicknames my kids when they get here. He waits on them to do something. Well, we got here, and uh, Levi, my oldest, he's 32 now, and he was just a boy when we came. And uh, we got here. He had jet lag. He couldn't eat, and he ate a bowl of fruit, and so he nicknamed him uh, Fruit Bowl, fruit, fruit Cup, cup Fruit Cup. So the whole time we were here, he called Levi Fruit Cup. Then uh, my daughter, he picked a good one for my daughter. My daughter, Carrie, she's 30 now. She was just a young teenage girl when she came the first time. And she made the mistake of saying something burned her lips. And he's nicknamed her Hot Lips. <laughs> <laughs> then the next year, my next child came, Aaron, my third uh, child, my middle uh, son. Aaron is 29 now. He has uh, cerebral palsy. He has uh, tremors. He has um, a condition called dystonia. Uh, he has had about seven surgeries over his lifetime, including brain surgery. And uh, my kids can take picking, 
and because I pick home all the time, and they do me as well. Aaron has to have a straw to drink because if he holds a cup, he'll shake everything out of it. So his name nickname became Quick Draw McStraw. I think that's what it was. And so the whole time he was here, that's what he got. So uh, that's why we pick back and forth a lot. It doesn't bother me one bit. Um, by the time the week's over, we're such a bad influence on each other. Uh, is We don't have revival. We normally ourselves we get ourselves in trouble. From time to time, I will rebuke my people at my church and tell them to calm down in the balcony. I'll tell them to behave. Y'all, y'all settle down, and I don't like cutting up in our balcony. But there is no balcony. And I got that from him. And people, uh, people will come to church thinking we got a balcony, thinking, and I'm rebuking people in the balcony. There is no balcony there. And so uh, your your pastor has been a bad influence on me over the years. Exodus chapter 16. If you're able, like I want you to read, and you can look with me in verse number 14 through verse number 21. The Bible says, when the dew that lay was gone up, Exodus 16, verse 14, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, but they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord had given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord had commanded, gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his sins. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much and nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Verse 20, Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was wroth with them, and they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. This is a, a commonly known story about the manna that would fall out of the sky. God would give them every morning to feed the children of Israel as thousands if possibly close to a million of Jews were taken care of in the wilderness every single day God was sent a dew and in that dew was this uh, little small little grain if you would that they would gather together every single morning and they would use it and eat it they would actually if you go back and study other scriptures about this particular manna it's called manna which was actually angel food the Bible actually refers to it that way if you go back and look at how they prepared it, they got it together, they ground it up into a meal. The Bible actually says this. It even talked about how it was like corn. They ground it in the meal, corn, put it in the oven, baked it. Proves to me God likes cornbread. That's what the angels eat. That's what I got from it. There are several things about this, and I want to give you just a few thoughts this morning. I see the clock says 11.30. And we're going, I would say we'd go by Arkansas time, but that goes forward, so I can't use that. <laughs> I'm just going to hold you for a few minutes to give you a few thoughts. There's four things about happens in the text I want to make mention of. You see the manna in verse number 14 and 15. God provided them every single day angel food. According to Psalm chapter 78, verse number 28, it refers to that as being the food that the angels actually ate. God was good to the children of Israel, gave them heavenly food. It was a small, round, sweet, white, little piece of grain that fell to the ground. They turned it into a meal, and so they began to eat it, and that's how they were sustained for 40 years. This is how they lived and survived. This man is a picture of Jesus Christ. You go back to the New Testament, look in the New Testament. He was the manna, the spiritual manna that fell from heaven that supplied the needs of the people, that took care of the needs of those that, that were hungry and needed something from God. I'll say today that he is the manna, that every person needs. Whether somebody in South Georgia, somebody in North Washington, does not matter where you're from, doesn't matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter your education, your wisdom, your intelligence, or your ignorance, does not matter. Every person across this world, whether it be from the Philippines, America, Russia, China, doesn't matter. We all have the same need. We need Christ, Amen. that spiritual man that comes from heaven. Amen. You see the monotony of the text, verse 16 through 18. The Bible said that they gathered it every single morning. Every single day they got up early in the morning. Now they had to do this 
early in the morning. Because the Bible said when the sun come out, it melted it. So that means every one of them got up before the sun come up. Before they ever got up, before the, uh, the heat of the day set in, the coolness of the morning was still there. They got out and they gathered up this manna. Every single day, the monotony of doing this every <coughs> single morning. They had to do it before the sun come up. They could not be lazy. They could not be undisciplined. They had to do this every day. If you did not do this, you went hungry. Amen. You had to get up and do that every single day. And I'm not going to get sidetracked on how we could preach that even in this modern day time. You see the monotony of it. <laughs> you see the migraine that Moses had. If you look at verse number 19 and 20, we know he got a migraine because the Bible says, Hearken now to my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people that God were, and thou mayest bring the causes unto God. I'm in chapter 18 and verse number 20, and he teaches them the ordinance and tells them to walk in these ordinances in verse number 20. And he tells them all these things they're supposed to do. And uh, they're supposed to literally every day get up, get this manna as they were commanded to. Yet the Bible says, if you go back and look in the text, that the Bible says that there were some that did not do it. They literally let it go. It said, I read their own scripture a while ago, but it says that they, in verse number 19, 20, I believe it is, notwithstanding the hearken not unto Moses, but some of them, verse 20, left a bit until the morning, and the bread worms sustained. And Moses was wroth with them. He got mad. All they had to do was get up every day and gather it and eat it, and it was theirs. But for some reason or other, some of them said, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to sleep in today. I'm too tired. I worked too late, stayed up watching Saturday Night Live. I'm not getting up early in the morning and go out there and gather up this uh, manna that's on the ground. And so they let it go. The Bible said it began to stink, began to bread worms. The Bible said Moses was raw, made him angry. There's nothing more frustrating when you tell people what they can do to be blessed by God. You tell them, if you do this, it's not going to take much. Just, just do this. Yeah. God's going to bless you. It's there. Yeah. All you got to do is just collect it. Claim it's yours. It's there. Go get it. And then watch them miss it. It's probably one of the most frustrating things I deal with in ministry. Is to show somebody what the Word of God says, watch them ignore it, and pay the price for it when they could have been blessed. And so you see his migraine. Verse number 21, you see the melting. The Bible was saying they gathered it every morning. Every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. You see, preacher, why is this important? The sun melted this thing away that was left on the ground. God gave them in abundance. Not one person would go hungry. Not one person would go today and their belly would growl if they simply did what God said. God took care of them. But at the close of the morning, when the sun come out, even though God gave it in abundance, God melted it away. Everything that they neglected and did not collect God melted it away. We look this morning, I'm looking through the scriptures at times, and there's three other times that God did this, well, three times specifically, that God took something and melted it into something else. And we'll preach on the simple thought of the ministry of melting. The ministry of melting. Why God dissolves something away, transforms it into something else. The focus this morning is how God melts things down in our life. Now the word melt is mentioned 38 times in the Bible. I'm not going to mention all 38. I'm only going to give you three times that he does this. When you melt something, you're turning a solid into a gel or a liquid or even a vapor. When you do that, many times it can be mixed with something else to create something good. But to do that, it requires heat. It requires trauma. And it takes time to do this. This applies spiritually. When God morphs one thing into another through the process of melting, it takes time and heat and patience. And once he does that, then it can be turned into something positive. I want to show you three times he does this in melting. It sounds like a real left brain thought, but if you'll stay with me, Lord will help us this morning. I believe that in my heart. Now, melting is mentioned throughout the Bible, but I just want to focus on three times in the book of Exodus. Just mentioned, first of all, my text. Why would God melt this manna every single morning? Why would God decide to do this and melt it away? The reason is simple. 
that when they neglected the manna, the manna would begin to breed worms and it would begin to stink. So God let it begin to melt under the heat of the sun. So every single day, if they made the mistake of not gathering the manna up and they messed up in their relationship with God by not gathering the manna, God melted it away. The next morning, he gave them a fresh, fresh batch of brand new manna. This is teaching us that God daily will melt away your mistakes you made the day before. Amen. And God will give you a brand new chance the very next day. Amen. The mercies of God are new to us every single day. Amen. One thing you have to understand about human nature, we at our best are going to fail. We'll make mistakes. We'll trip ourselves up. You think you're going to have a good day today. You start off pretty good. Read your Bible field for, for a few moments. You may pray a few minutes. Go to your job. Do what you're going to do. So I'm going to have a good day. Before the day's out, you trip up. You make a mistake. You do something you know dishonors God. You feel bad about it. You feel, Lord, I, I messed up again. Lord, forgive me. I wish I, wish I could start over again. Well, you can't. But God melts it away. The next morning you wake up is a new day. God gives you another chance at it. Amen. God, another time that you try to give. Yeah. I am thankful. I'm not justifying sin. I'm not saying, well, you mess up. Don't worry about it. It's all okay. I'm not saying that. There's a price when we make mistakes. There's a price that we have to pay when we sin. But the fact of the matter is, we all fail God almost every single day of our life. But i got good news. God melts it away. Amen. God's grace can forgive it. God's grace can give you another chance and you can start all over again the very next day. Is it not interesting that when they took the manna and they gathered the manna, they baked the manna. Now this is what's interesting. They literally gathered it up, they ground it into a meal, they added stuff to it, then they put it in the ovens and they baked it. Is it not interesting that the manna could handle being baked in an oven but could not handle the sunlight? Why would God do that? God said that manna can handle being baked and sustain you and bless you. But God in His sovereignty so worked the ingredients of that manna that if it was brought into the presence of the sunlight, it melted away. The reason being is this. If you gather it, and you do what you're supposed to do with it, I'll bless you and feed you. If you don't gather it, I have already worked in the system of the manna that it can't stand sunlight, it has just simply melted away. I'll be honest with you, Dave, the preacher, I made a mistake, I messed up. Join the club. Preach, I trip up all the time. Join the club. Amen. This is not about being the perfect saint. This is not about being the perfect church member. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to tell you how you can tell when somebody's in trouble, how, how you can tell you're in trouble in your relationship with God. It's not so much that you don't make mistakes. It's when you make mistakes and you do things that you know doesn't honor God and you no longer, you no longer feel the guilt of it. You no longer feel the despair of letting Him down. It's one thing to trip up and you go to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up again, I'm going to try to do better. That's one thing. It's another thing to trip up and do wrong and not even care. When you're in that place, you're in a dangerous place in your walk with God. Yeah. Ezekiel 16, verse 4, excuse me, Exodus 16, verse 14 through 21 in the text, he melted their mistakes. He melted away the things that they messed up in. We sometimes neglect the Lord. According to John chapter 6, verse 32, 32 Jesus is our manna that come from heaven. Sometimes in our relationship with Him, we neglect Him. Sometimes we don't do right by Him. I've got good news. The next day is a new day. You can do business with God, make the thing right, and make that day count for the glory of God. There's another time Melton's mentioned in Exodus. Look in chapter 32 quickly. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 20. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strode it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. 
Now there's no mentioning of melting in the sense except that it said that he took the calf that they made and burned it in the fire. That meant he melted it. He melted the calf down. The calf was the time that they, they made this golden calf, which was after the image of the calves that the Egyptians had worshipped. And so Moses goes up on the mountain. He's gone for a period of time. The children of Israel, in the absence of God's man, they start to think he's died, so they're going to just start partying. And so they make a golden calf after the image of the gods of Egypt. Moses comes down from the mountain, realizes what they've done. He gets angry at them again. He takes the golden calf. He takes it off the side and they put it in the fire. It begins to melt down. It loses the form of the golden calf. Now it turns into a solid gold slab. He stands there and lets it begin to cool off and harden. Once it hardens, he then grinds it. They come in with millstones. They grind it down into a very fine dust powder. The reason I know that to be so is because after he did that, he put it into the water and made them drink it. They literally drank up the golden water, the golden calf. They drank it into their system. Now, when you take gold and you ground it down to a very fine dust, so fine it can slip through a number 200 sieve. If you take gold dust and put it in clear water, it turns it blood red. If you take a gold, uh, a paint, uh, a paint, um, I'm trying to think of a name, a name brand of just spray paint, gold color spray paint. If you don't shake it up and you look at it, you spray it, it normally will shoot out red. If you take gold dust, put it in crystal clear water, it turns it blood red. The picture is this, is that the blood of Christ has to cleanse them of the mistake that they made of idolatry and sinning against God. Amen. This is a more severe case than what happened with the man. What's happening is, is they have rose up because God's man has not been there. He's not there with the oversight. And so because of that, they turn this calf, they make this calf. And so he melts it down, he grinds it to a fine powder, they put it in the water, and they have to drink this up. He melts it down. What's he doing? He's melting their mutiny. The mutiny that they took against Moses as a man of God. The idolatry that they got involved in caused him not to come in and melt it all back down again. Can I tell you that forsaking God requires him to melt our sin down until we finally put him first in our life again. The fact of the matter is, is that many times, and I'm not talking about the tripping up of the man of not gathering it as we should, but sometimes in our lives we do things that we should not do. We do things that we should not do that are severely displeasing to God. And many times God has to take that sin and melt it away, that idolatry that sometimes we get involved in. God has to melt it away. You cannot say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done and still have the golden calf sitting there. It has to be done away with and has to be dissolved in our lives. And so he melts it down. He melts the mutiny away. They backslide on God without the oversight of God's man because he's not there to be with them. And so he gets there. He dissolves our idolatry and turns it into, a plan, into something that they themselves can now deal with. And ingest it, taking their life. Forsaking God requires him to melt our sin down to dissolve it until we finally put Him first in our lives again. Can I say this morning that as children of God, when you get saved by the grace of God, and I've been saved a long time, when you get saved by the grace of God, there's a honeymoon that takes place. Many times you'll see somebody come to altar, or how you do it here many times, the pastor will pray, and that person in the heart will give the heart to Christ, or however you go about that. The sinner gives his heart to Christ. What happens is many times that individual will feel such a relief. They feel the burdens off their back of their sin and they get saved by the grace of God and then the honeymoon's on. Things start going pretty good. The birds start singing louder. The sunsets become more beautiful. Things are going really good. And the first thought the person has is, I should have done this a long time ago. Man, this is great. I feel like the whole world is off my shoulder. But there's something going to happen. God allows that to go for a period of time. Maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe a month, maybe several months, maybe a year. 
that God allows them to have that spiritual honeymoon with things that seem like fall in place. But somewhere down the line, God's going to require what He bought. Right. What I mean by that is when God requires what He buys, is that God begins to let adversity come. God begins to let things happen in life that's not necessarily enjoyable. So preacher, why is that? The literally the sun comes out and begins to beat down on them and God begins to chip away out of their life things that dishonors Him. God begins to mold them and shape them into the image of His Son. Can I tell you, God didn't just save you just to save you from hell. Amen. And God didn't save you just to save you from your problems. Right. God saved you to conform you to the image of His Son yeah. to make you look more like Him. Amen. To get to that point, you're going to have to go through some adversity. Okay. So God will start chipping away. He'll bring problems in. And those problems begin to form you and to be what you should be for God. Every person I've ever met that I've lived a life where they honor God and you get around them and they're special people, every one of them have gone through a lot of problems. And they've simply kept their eyes on God. They've understood that this is a process. God paid for me when He saved me. He has the right to do with me what He sees fit. And He lets adversity come. I'll be honest with you. I mentioned my middle son Aaron. I have not enjoyed all the surgeries I've watched my son go through. I'm not sitting there and saying, Boy, God sure is good. There have been a lot of times I've sat there with tears going down my cheeks. And it's not fun when you see your son have one of those halos bolted into his head and knowing that they're drilling holes into his skull and, and going in and doing the work in his brain. That's not enjoyable. But when you go through something like that and you say, Lord, your will be done in this matter. Yes. You do what you want to do with this. There's a reason why you're doing this. And my son this morning, is already, he's in church. He's faithful like clockwork. He's in the house of God. And so... When you go through things and you say, Lord, this is your hand on my life, not everything that comes in my life from you is always going to be positive, sometimes going to be negative. You're going to bring some bad things in my life from time to time. But if I keep my eyes on you, I look more and more like Him. Yes, amen. And so God brings it. He melts our mutinies. He melts our mistakes. Exodus chapter 38, just one more verse and break. My stomach's growled twice. And when a preacher's stomach growled, if he preaches long, there's something wrong with him. Exodus chapter number 38, verse number 8. There's one more thing he melts, and this one he melts our motives. Exodus 38, verse 8. And he made the labor of brass and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the building, Brother Art was dealing with the tabernacle, temple and how it's built, and the measurements, and all that. But in Exodus 38, in the original construction of the tabernacle, he lays out all the artifacts and the utensils and the furniture inside the temple. Here, he lays out the laver. The laver was this big old bowl where the priest came. He sacrificed the animals. He'd come, and before he'd go into the holy place, he'd look in that laver, and it would, would reflect his image to him. It was like a mirror. It was made of brass. And so he'd look in, he'd see his reflection. Any imperfection, he would clean himself. He would wash it off, make sure it's clean and right before he stood before God. The Bible tells you where this labor come from, what it was made of. In Exodus 38, verse number 8, <clears throat> the Bible says, in verse number 8, I'm trying to find, and he made the labor of brass and a foot of it of brass of the looking glasses, who gave it to him? Of the women assembling. The looking glasses of the women. What's a looking glass? It's a mirror. And what it was is that when it come time to build this labor, this big bowl of brass, to do that, what they needed was very fine brass that would reflect. Because they didn't have mirrors like we do today. The way they did it, they took brass and they shined it and made it so bright that it would actually reflect a person's image. They're going to do this with this bowl, this massive bowl of water. So the women that came to church, if you would, had to give up their mirrors. 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 
Now, I know the man's got one in the men's bathroom, and I hadn't gone explored in the women's bathroom, but I assume you have a mirror in the women's bathroom. Right before I took the Lakeland Baptist Church a year before I did, they built a new building. Beautiful building. And all the bathrooms have that main thing you got to have, and other than the toilets, they got mirrors. The men's bathroom's got it. The men are just as vain as the women. Amen. I'm not naming nobody, but I stood there and watched somebody stood there at that front mirror in the middle of the vestibule there looking at themselves in the mirror a while ago. And it weren't a woman, it was a man. <laughs> We're all vain. I mean, you'll come in and make sure your hair's right, and you don't have hair on your head hardly. You still make sure it's right. We're vain that way. But to make the labor that they use, they use the women's mirrors, their looking glasses. So that meant the women who came to church, who always examined themselves, make sure the hair was right, they were in order, they gave up the ability to see themselves. They gave it up so they could make this big labor so the priest could see himself and then go inside the temple and offer up sacrifice for everybody so they'd all be right with God. So preacher, why did they do this? They would take all these mirrors and melt them down and melt them into a great big pot where this man could see himself. Can I tell you one thing that God wants to melt is our motives? I'm going to shock you. We really didn't come to see you. And you really didn't come to see me. If you came to see me, you came for the wrong reason. If I came to see you, I came for the wrong reason. There's different ones I talked about before I got here. I tell and ask about because I knew you wouldn't remember because he's just a boy. And I was talking about Brother Gay. I said, Brother Gay's one, one of the most precious men I've ever met. And I said, he's from the West. I said, I have great song leader in my church. I have great teachers in my church. I have people in my church that has that thick southern accent. I mean, we, we had a snow a couple of years ago in Lakeland, Georgia. I have people that were born and raised in that town I'm talking about adults that put on Facebook of snowmen that they built that were that big. <laughs> they had never seen a substantial snow in their life. We're talking about people in their twenties and thirties, and they're going, they're going nuts. Look at the snow, and I'm going, man, y'all embarrassing me. <laughs> Build snowmen that tall, thrill the day, and it literally was a dusting of snow. You just don't get snow in South Georgia. It just doesn't happen. All we got is heat. We got two seasons. Y'all got four. We got two. Hot and hotter. <laughs> I didn't bring a jacket. I didn't think I needed a jacket. I said, Dad, did you bring a jacket? I said, no. Son, is, we're talking about August. When we, when we left, it's 95 degrees humidity. It was in the upper 90s. And son, you step outside and you can you forget a shower. And so that's kind of, but I've got godly people in my church. But there's godly people in this church. Amen. Thank God there is. But people that are godly, that love God, that have that about them, they come to church not to be seen. Their desire is, is that somebody get help and get close to God in their life. It's not about being seen. You can always see those people, and we have them in our church too. They think the church will stop if they didn't show up. No, the church might even be better off. I probably shouldn't have said that. Don't tell them I said that. He'll melt your motives. He'll melt you down and say, it's not about you. It's about people getting help from me. This is the ministry of melting. In 2 Peter chapter number 2, there's going to be a great meltdown going to take place. 2 Peter chapter 3, excuse me. In verse number 10 through 12, 2 Peter. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night and in the which the heavens shall pass away with the great noise and the elements shall melt with the fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming the day of our God, a day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt in fervent heat. I'm thankful for where I live. I'm thankful for the environment that I'm in. I'm thankful that I live in the place. I don't have to worry about toxic things. I'm thankful where I mean we're taught to be conservationists according to scripture. I'm thankful for all that. But one day it's all gonna melt away. Amen. All this is gonna be gone. 
God's going to melt it all away and God's going to make a new heaven, new earth. Yeah. I'm glad all my hope's not in this world. Mm -hmm. I'm just passing through. My hope's not in this world. Yeah. And I thank God that it ain't. I preach this more in the ministry of melting. You make a mistake in your life, you mess up, it ain't the end of the world. Just go to God, get it right. So Lord, I'm sorry I messed up. Would you forgive me? God said, I will. His mercies are new every morning. He says it over again in the Bible. His mercies are new every morning. And the next day you start all over again. If you made, if you got in sin, you're not where you should be with God. I've got good news. God can melt that away too. Amen. You can get that thing right, get in the blood of Christ, make that thing right. Amen. And also on this simple thought, in your life and serving God, if you'll give yourself up to the things of Christ, let Him have His way, somebody else can get some help. These women giving that looking glass up, I'm telling you, that's, that's, that's big. <laughs> that a woman would give up her mirror and say, I want somebody else to be able to, get, be able to see themselves, so I'll give up the mirror, and that's what it means. When we come to church and we realize it's not about us, but it's about seeing Him. And that's what this revival means about. It's not about us. It's about seeing Him. We'll have a